moment a definition. On November 14th, the members of the Tectonic Theater Project traveled to Laramie, Wyoming and conducted interviews with people of the town. During the next year, we returned to Laramie several times and conduct over 200 interviews. The play you're about to see is edited from those interviews, as well as journal entries by members of the company and other found techs. Company member, Greg Piriotti. My first interview was with Detective Rob Debris. At the start of the interview, he was sitting behind his desk, sitting something like this. Born and raised here. My family was a third generation. My grandparents moved here in the early 1900s. We've had basically three. Well, my daughter makes it fourth generation. Quite a while. It's a good place to live. Lots of, lots of space. Now, all the towns in southern Wyoming got laid out in space because the railroad came through. It was how far they could go without having to refuel and free water. And uh, Laramie was a major stopping point. That's why all the towns are spaced so far apart. One of the largest states in the country and the least populated. There is so much space between people and towns here, so much time for reflection. Rebecca Hilliker, head of the theater department at the University of Wyoming. You have an opportunity to be happy in your life here. Um, I found that people here were nicer than in the Midwest where I used to teach because they were happy. They were glad the sun was shining and it shines a lot here. Yeah, what you have is you have the old type traditional time ranchers. They've been here forever. Lammy's been the hub of where they come for their supplies and stuff like that. Stewardship is one thing all our ancestors taught us. Eileen Engen, rancher. If you don't take care of your land and you ruin it, then you lose your living. So you first of all have to take care of your land and do everything you can to improve it. I love it here. Doc O'Connor, limousine driver. You can put me back in that mess up there back east. Best thing about it is the climate, the cold, the wind. They say a Wyoming wind will drive a man insane. But you know what? It don't bother me. Well, sometimes it bothers me, but most of the time, we don't. And then you've got uh, the medical staff here in Laramie. I moved here after living in a couple of big cities. Dr. Cantwell. I loved it there, but you'd have to be out of your mind to let your kids out after dark. And here, in the summertime, my kids play out at night till 11, and I don't think twice about it. And then you have the people who live in Laramie, basically. Well, I moved here from rural Texas. Zaki Salmon, Laramie resident. Now in Laramie, if you don't know a person, you will definitely know someone they know. So it can only be one degree removed at most. And uh, well, for me, I love it. I mean, I love to go to the grocery store because I get to visit with, with uh, well, four or five or six different people every time I go. And I don't really mind people knowing my business because what's my business? I mean, my business is basically good. I like the trains too. They don't bother me. Well, some of the times they bother me, but most of the time they don't even though one goes by every 13 minutes at where I live. Doc actually lives up in Bolsar, but everybody in Laramie knows him. He is also not really a doctor. They used to carry cattle, them trains. Now they carry is diapers and cars. Laramie is better than uh, where I grew up, I'll give it that. It's a good place to live. Good people, lots of space. Now, when the incident happened with that boy, Lots of press people came here, and one time, one of them started following me out there to the crime scene, and, uh, well, it was a beautiful day, gorgeous day, real clear and crisp, it was just that sky blue that, oh, you know, you'll never be able to paint it, it's just sky blue, it's gorgeous, and then the mountains in the background, and a little snow on them, and this one reporter, a lady, a uh, person, was out there, and she said, well, who found the boy? Who was out here anyway? And I said, well, this is a really popular area for people to run in. Mountain biking is really big out here. Horseback riding, and it's just, well, it's close to town. And she looked at me and she said, Who in the hell would want to run out here? And I'm thinking, lady, you're just missing the point. You know, all you got to do is turn around, see the mountains, 
smell the air, listen to the birds, just take in what's around you. And they were just nothing but the story. I didn't feel judged. I just felt that they were stupid. They're missing the point. They're just missing the whole point. It's hard to talk about Laramie now. To tell you what Laramie is to us. Jedediah Schultz. Now, if you would ask me before, I would have told you, Laramie, it's a beautiful town. Secluded enough you can have your own identity. A town with a strong sense of community. Everyone knows everyone. A town with personality that most larger cities have been stripped of. Now, after Matthew, Laramie has become a town defined by an accent, a crime. We've become Waco. We've become Jasper. We are a noun, a definition, a sign. We may be able to get rid of that, but uh, it's going to take a while. Moment. Journal entries. Journal entries. Member of the company. Greg Periotti. Moises called saying he had an idea for his next theater project, but there was a somberness in his voice. So I asked what it was about. And he told me he wanted to do a piece about what's happening in Wyoming. Lee told me the company was thinking of going out to Laramie to conduct interviews and that they wanted me to come. But I'm hesitant. I have no real interest in prying into a town's unraveling. I've never done anything like this in my life. How do you get people to talk to you? What do you ask? The company has agreed that we should go to Laramie for a week and interview people. I'm a bit afraid about taking 10 people in a trip of this nature. We have to make some safety rules. No one works alone. Everyone carries cell phones. We've made some preliminary contacts with Rebecca Hilliker, head of the theater department at the University of Wyoming. She's hosting a party for us our first night in Laramie and has promised to introduce us to a few possible interviewees. Moment, Rebecca Hilliker. I must tell you when I first heard that you were thinking of coming here, when you first called me, I wanted to say, you've just kicked me in the stomach, you know? Why are you doing this to me? But then I thought, that's stupid, you're not doing this to me. And more important, I thought about it and decided that we've had so much, so much negative closure on this whole thing. And the students, they really need to talk. When this happened, they started talking and then the media descended and all the dialogue just stopped. You know, I really love my students because they're free thinkers and you may not like what they have to say and you may not like their opinions because they can be very redneck, um, but they're honest and they're truthful. So there's an excitement here, um, a dynamic here with my students that I never had when I was in the Midwest or North Dakota because there, there was so much puritism that dictated how people looked at the world. A lot of times they didn't have an opinion. You couldn't get them to express an actual opinion. Um, and quite honestly, I'd rather have opinions that I don't like and, you know, have that dynamic in education. There's a student I think you should talk to. His name is Jedediah Schultz. Moment. Angels in America. I've lived in Wyoming a whole life. The family, well, they've been here for generations. Now, it came time for me to go to college. Uh, my family, they, they couldn't afford to send me to college. You know, I wanted to study theater. And if I was going to get into college, I was going to have to get out on scholarship. So they have this uh, competition each year, this Wyoming State High School competition. And I knew that if I didn't take first place in the duets, that uh, I wasn't gonna get a scholarship. So I went to the theater department of the university and I asked one of the professors, I'm like, look, I need a, I need a killer scene. He was like, here you go, this is it. And it was from Angels in America. So I read it and I knew that if I did a good enough job, I could win the competition. And when the time came, I went home and I told my mom and my dad so they could come see me perform. I mean, now look, my parents, they're the type of people to go to everything, every hockey game, every baseball game, everything I've ever done. And they sat me in their room and they're like, Jedediah, if you perform this scene, we will not be in attendance because we believe that it is wrong. We believe that homosexuality is wrong. They felt that strongly about it. So strongly that they wouldn't see their own son do probably the most important thing he's ever done up to that point in time in his life. And uh, I had no idea what to do. I mean, I have never gone against my parents' wishes before. And so I was kind of worried about it. But you know what? I did it anyways. And all I can remember is when we were done, me and my scene partner, we looked, we shook hands, and there was a standing ovation. It was incredible. And we took first place and we won. And that's how come I can afford to be here at the university because of that scene. It was one of the best moments of my life and my parents weren't there. And to this day, it's 
the only thing my parents have not seen me do. And thinking back on it, I think, why did I do it? Why did I oppose my parents? Because, I mean, look, I'm not gay. So why did I do it? I mean, I guess the, really the only honest answer I can give you is <laughs> I wanted to win. It was such a good scene. It was like the best scene. Do you know uh, Mr. Kushner? Maybe you can talk to him. Moment, journal entries. Company member Greg Periotti. We arrived today in the Denver airport and drove to Laramie. The moment we crossed the Wyoming border, I swear I saw a herd of buffalo. Also, I thought it was strange that the Wyoming sign said, Wyoming, like no place on earth, instead of Wyoming, like no place else on earth. Company member Lee Fondakowski. We arrived in Laramie tonight, just past the welcome to Laramie sign, population 26,687. The first thing to greet us was Walmart. In the dark, we could be on any main drag in America, fast food chains, gas stations. But as we drove into the downtown area by the railroad tracks, the buildings still look like a turn of the century Western town. Oh, and as we pass the University Inn on the sign where amenities such as heated pool, cable TV are usually touted, it said hate is not a Laramie value. Moment, Allison and Marge. I met today with two longtime Laramie residents, Allison Mears and Marge Murray, two social service workers who taught me a thing or two. Well, what Laramie used to be like when Marge was growing up, well, it was mostly rural. Yeah, it was. I enjoyed it. You know, my kids all had horses. Well, there was more land. I mean, you could keep your pet cow, your little chickens, you know, just have your little bit of acreage. Yeah, I could run around the house and all my togethers, you know, do the housework while the kids were at school and nobody could see me. And if they came that close. Well, then that's their problem. Yep. I just want to make sure I got that expression right. In your all-togethers? Well, yeah, honey. Why wear clothes? Now, how is he going to use that in his play? So this was a big ranching town? Oh, not just ranching. This was a big old railroad town. At one time, before they moved everything to Cheyenne and Green River and Omaha. So now, well, it's just a drive through spot for the railroad because... Even, what is it, in the 50s? Well, they had one big roundhouse and they had such a shop, they could build a complete engine. They did, my mom worked there. Your mother worked in the roundhouse. Yeah, she washed engines. Her name was Minnie. Uh, we used to, uh, you know, sing that song for her. You know that song? What song is that? Uh, Run for the roadhouse, Minnie. They can't corner you there. <laughs> oh, but I'll tell you, Wyoming is bad in terms of jobs. I mean, the university has the big whoop de doo jobs, but Wyoming, unless you're a professional, well, the bulk are just minimum wage jobs. Yeah, um... I've been either in the service industry or bartending most of my life, and now I know everybody in town. And she does. And I do. Now that I'll tell you. Here in Laramie, there's a difference, and there always has been. What it is is a class distinction. It's about the well-educated and the ones that are not educated. And the ones that are educated don't understand why the ones that aren't educated don't just go get educated. That's why I told you my kids had to fight to be in school, because I was a bartender. Never mind, though, because I was the best bartender this town ever had. And she was. That's not bragging. That's a fact. But here in Laramie, if it weren't for the university, we'd just be SOL. What is that SOL? Well, do I have to say it? Well, it's shit out of luck. <laughs> oh, Lordy, you've got that on your tape. Boy, you're getting an education today. Yeah, I, I guess I am. So let me just ask you, what was your response when this happened to Matthew Shepard? 
Well, <coughs> I've been close enough to the case to know many of the people. I have a daughter on the sheriff's department. As far as the gay issue, I don't give a damn one way as long as they don't bother me. And even if they did, I'd just say no thank you. And that's the attitude of most of the Laramie population. They might poke one if they were in a bar situation, you know, they had been drinking. You might even smack one on the mouth, but then they just say, I don't swing that way and go on about their business. Laramie is very live and let live. I'd say that Marge probably knows a lot more except she's even willing to say, and we have to respect her for that. Well, where are you going with this story? Oh, well, we still haven't decided. When we finished, we're gonna try to bring it around to Laramie. Okay, then there are parts I won't tell you. Moment, Matthew. Company member, Greg Periotti. Today, for the first time, we met someone who actually knew Matthew. Referred to him as Matt, Trish Steger, owner of a shop in town. Yeah, um, Matt used to come into my shop, and that's how I knew him. It was the first time I heard to him referred to as Matt instead of Matthew. Did he go by Matt to everyone? Well, on the 2nd of October, I get a phone call about uh, 10 after 7. Doc O'Connor. It was Matthew Shepard. And he said, can you pick me up at the corner of 3rd and Grand? So, anyhow, I pull up to the corner to see Matthew Shepard. You know, it's a little guy, about 5'2", soaking wet. I bet you 97 pounds, tops. They say he weighed 110, but I wouldn't believe it. They also said he was about 5'5 five, five in the newspaper, but this man, he was really only about 5'2", maybe 5'1". So he walks up to the window. Now, I'm going to try to explain this in steps so you can get a better understanding of the principle of this man. So he walks up to the window and I say, are you Matthew Shepard? And he says, yeah, I'm Matthew Shepard, but I don't want you to call me Matthew Shepard or Mr. Shepard or Matthew. I, want, I don't want you to call me anything. My name is Matt. And you know what? I am gay. And we're going to a gay bar. Do you have a problem with that? And I said, how are you paying? The fact is, Laramie don't have any gay bars. And for the matter, neither does Wyoming. So he was hiring me to take him to Fort Collins, Colorado, about an hour away. See, Matt was a blunt little shit. You know what I'm saying? But I liked him. Because he was straightforward. You see what I'm saying? Maybe a little gay, but he was straightforward. And I liked him. I don't know. You know, how does any one person really tell about another? Um, you should really talk to my sister, Romaine. She was a close friend of Matthew's. We never um, actually called him Matthew. You know, actually, most of the time, we just call him Choo Choo, you know, because he used to come at you, and then that just kind of, you know, turned into Choo Choo. Um, and, uh, and whenever I think of Matthew, I always just think of this, you know, incredible beaming smile. I mean, he'd, he'd walk into a room and he'd be like, <laughs> you know, and, and he'd just make everyone smile. Um, and he, he made you feel great. You know, and... Um, and he'd always want to sit, uh, he'd always want to uh, sit with me at the coffee shop, you know, so he could like talk to me while I'm working and stuff. And if someone was sitting in that seat, he would just stare at them <laughs> until they left. And then, you know, he would claim the spot. Um, but, uh, but Matthew, he, he definitely had a political side to him. I mean, he, he really wanted to get into political affairs. I mean, that's all his big interest was. You know, was watching NBC and MSNBC. You know, that's the only TV station I ever saw his TV tuned into. Um, you know, he was he was just really smart in political affairs, but not too smart in common sense things. So, uh, so he goes to Laramie for school. Matthew was very shy at first. John Peacock, Matthew Shepard's academic advisor. The point of being almost somewhat mousy, I'd almost say, but he was having some difficulties adjusting, and but this this was home for him, and he made that quite clear. And so his mousiness, his shyness, it it gave way to a person who was excited about this track that he was going to embark on, and he was just figuring out, wanting to work in human rights, and how he's going to do that. 
when that happens, this person begins to bloom a little bit. So it's just starting to say, wow, there are opportunities here. and There are things I can do in this world. I can be important. Um, I did hear from Matthew about 48 hours before the attack. And um, he told me that he had joined the gay and lesbian group on campus. You know, he was really enjoying it. You know, and he was uh, getting ready for Pride Week and whatnot. I just, I mean, he was really stoked about school. Yeah, he was really happy to be here. And in retrospect, and I can only say this in retrospect, of course, I think that's where he was heading toward human rights, which only adds to the irony and tragedy of this. Moment, who's getting what? Let me tell you something else here. There's more gay people in Wyoming than meets the eye. I know, I know for a fact. They're not particularly the, uh, the what do you call them? The queens, the gay people queens, you know, run around homo type people. No, they're, they're the ones that throw bales of hay, jump on horses, brand them, kick ass. You see what I'm saying? And as I always say, you don't fuck with the Wyoming queer because they'll kick your fucking ass. But that's not the point of what I'm trying to say because I know a lot of gay people in Wyoming. I know a lot of people, period. I've been lived up here for 40 some odd years. You see what I'm saying? And I don't think people give a, in Wyoming give a damn one way or another if you're gay or straight. That's not the point of what I just said. It doesn't matter. There's eight men and one woman in a Wyoming bar, which often is the case. Now, you stop and think, who's getting what? Now, geez, it don't take a big intelligent mind to figure that one out. Moment. Easier said than done. My understanding when I first came here, Catherine Connolly, is that I was the first out lesbian or gay faculty member on campus. Um, I was asked in my interview what my husband did for a living, so I came out then. Do you want a funny story? When you first get here as a new faculty member, there's all these things you have to do. And so I was in my office and I noticed that this woman called. I was expecting it was, you know, a health insurance phone call, something like that. And so I called her back and I could hear her. She's working on her keyboard, clicking away. And I said, you know, this is Kathy Connolly returning your phone call. And she said, oh, it's you. And I thought, this is bizarre. And she said, I hear, I hear you're gay. I hear you are. And I was like, uh-huh. And she said, I hear you came as a couple. I'm one too, not a couple, just a person. And so she was the kind of lesbian who knew I was coming and she wanted to come over and meet me immediately. Um, she later told me that there were other lesbians in town who wouldn't be seen with me, that it would irreparably taint them, that just to be seen with me could be a problem. Well, when I came here, I knew it was gonna be hard as a lesbian. Jackie Salmon. But I kept telling myself, you know, people should live where they wanna live. And uh, there'd be times I'd go down to Denver and I'd, you know, go to gay bars and um, people would ask where I was from and I'd say, you know, Laramie, Wyoming. And uh, well, I met so many women down there from Wyoming, so many gay women who, uh, who grew up here and they're all like, you know, this is not a place where I can live. How can you live there? I had to get out and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, but every once in a while there would be a woman, you know, oh gosh, I miss Laramie. I mean, I really love it there. That's where I want to live. And they get this like starry eyed look. And I'm like, that's where you want to live, do it. I mean, imagine more gay people stayed in small towns. But I don't know. I guess uh, it's easier said than done, of course. Moment journal entries. Today we're moving from our motel and heading for the best Western. My hope is that it's a better Western. Lee Fondakowski. Today we're divided up to go to different churches in the community. Greg and I were given a Baptist church. We were welcomed into the services by the Reverend himself, standing at the entrance to the chapel. This is what I remember of the sermon that morning. Moment, the word. My dear brothers and sisters, I am here today to bring you the word of the Lord. Now I have a simple truth that I tell to my colleagues and I'm gonna tell it to you today. The word is either sufficient or it is not. Now, scientists tell me that human history, that the world is 5 billion or 6 billion years old. After all, what's a billion years, give or take? 
the Bible tells me that human history is 6,000 years old. Now, the word is either sufficient or it is not. Uh, the sociology of religion in the West. Rose Med Johnson, Unitarian minister. Dominant religious traditions in this town, Baptists, Mormon, they're everywhere. It's not just Salt Lake, you know, they're all over. The Mormon church is a little different thing going on that irritates some folks. Sharon Laws, stake ecclesiastical leader for the Mormon church. And that is that we absolutely believe that God still speaks to man. We don't think that it happened and some folks wrote it in the Bible. God speaks to us today, and we believe that. We believe that the prophet of the church has the authority to receive inspiration and revelation from God. So the spectrum would be uh, on the left side of that panel. So far left that I'm probably sitting by myself is me and the Unitarian Church. Unitarians are by and large humanists, many of whom are atheists. I mean, we're, you know, we're not even sure we're religion. And to my right on the spectrum, to his credit, Father Roger, Catholic priest, who is well established here too. And God bless him. He did not equivocate at all when this happened. He hosted the vigil for Matthew. I was really jolted because, you know, we did the vigil for Matthew. We wanted to get other ministers involved and we called some of them and they were not going to get involved. And it was like, we're just going to stand back and wait and see which way the wind is blowing. And that angered me immensely. We're supposed to stand out as leaders. I thought, wow, what is going on here? God has set boundaries. And one of our responsibilities is to learn what is it that God wants? So you study scripture, you look to your leaders, then you know what the bounds are. Now, once you kind of know what the bounds are, then you sort of get a feel for what's out of bounds. There's a proclamation that came out on the family. A family is defined as one woman, one man, and children. That's a family. That's about as clear as you can state it. There's no sexual deviation in the Mormon church, no, no leniency. We just think it's out of bounds. I'll warn you, you will be mocked. You will be ridiculed for the singularity of your faith, but you let the Bible be your God. It's in here. It's all in here. The Christian pastors, many of the conservative ones, were silent on this. Conservative Christians use the Bible to show the rest of the world. It says here in the Bible. In most Americans believe, and they do, that the Bible is the word of God. And how are you going to fight that? I am a biblicist, which means the Bible doesn't need me to be true. The Bible's true whether I believe it or not. The word is either sufficient or it is not. I arrived in Laramie on September 15th. I looked around, tumbleweed, cement factory, and said, what the hell am I doing in Wyoming? Three weeks later, I found out what the hell I'm doing in Wyoming. Moment, lifestyle one. Hello? Yes, hello. My name is Lee Fondakowski, and I'm here in Laramie working on, uh, with a theater company. I went to the Reverence, your husband's church on Sunday, and I was extremely interested in talking with the Reverend about some of his thoughts on recent events. Well, I don't know if he'll want to talk to you. He has very biblical views about homosexuality. He doesn't condone that kind of violence, but he doesn't condone that kind of lifestyle. You know what I mean? And he was just bombarded with press after this happened. And the media has just been terrible about this whole thing. Oh, I know. I really understand. It must have just been terrible. Oh, yes. I think we're all hoping this just goes away. Well, do you think maybe I could call back and just speak with your husband briefly? Well, all right. You can call him back tonight at nine. Okay. Thank you so much. I'll do that. Moment. The fireside. Today, Lee and I went to the fireside bar, which is the last place Matthew was seen in public. Fireside definitely feels like a college bar with a couple of pool tables and a stage area for karaoke. Still, the few regulars in late afternoon were hardly the college crowd. 
the first person we talked to was Matt Mickelson, who was the owner. My great great grandfather lived out here in 1962. He owned Lamy's first opera house. It was called the Old Blue Front. And in 1870, Louisa Guerrero Swain cast the first woman's ballot in any free election in the world. That's why Wyoming is the equality state. So what I want to do is I want to reestablish my bar, my business, as the old Blue Front Opera House and Good Time Emporium. You know, I want to have a restaurant, I want to have a gift shop, and I want to have a pool hall and do all that shit, you know, every night, ladies' night. So the far side is the next step towards the old Blue Front Opera House and Good Time Emporium. So what about the other night when Matthew Shepard was here? We had a karaoke night that night, 20 or 30 people here. Matthew Shepard came in, sitting right, well, right where you're sitting, just hanging out. I mean, if you want to talk to somebody, you should talk to Matt Galloway. He was the kid that was bartending that night. You'd have to meet him. His character stands for itself. Hey, is Galloway bartending tonight? Okay, I'm going to keep this brief, uh, quick, get it over with. But it will be everything, factual, just the facts. Here we go. 10 o'clock, I clock in, usual time. Tuesday nights, 10, third day. Um, Matthew Shepard shows up alone, sits down and orders a Heineken. Phil Labrie, friend of Matthew Shepard's. Matt liked to drink Heineken and nothing else. Heineken, even though you have to pay 95 for a six pack, he'd always buy the same beer. So what can I tell you about Matt? Well, uh, if you had 100 customers like him, it'd be the most perfect bar I've ever been in, okay? And nothing to do with sexual orientation, um, absolute mannerisms, manners, politeness, intelligence, taking care of me, as in tips, everything, conversation, uh, dress nice, clean cut. Some people, you know, just sit down, please, thank you, offers intellect, you know, within, uh, within their vocabulary. Um, so he just kicks it here. Uh, didn't seem to have any worries or like he was looking for anyone. Just enjoy his drink and the company around. Now, approximately 11.45, 11.35, 11.45, Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson come in. Uh, I didn't know their names then, but they're the accused. They're the perps, they're the accused. They walked in just very stone-faced, you know, dirty, grungy, rude, gamey, that type of thing. They walked up to the bar uh, and, as you know, paid for a picture with dimes and quarters, which is, uh, which is something you don't forget. You don't forget that 550 in dimes and quarters, that's a freaking nightmare. Now, Henderson and McKinney, they didn't seem intoxicated at all. Uh, they came in, they just ordered a beer, took the picture with them back into their pool room and kept to themselves. Next thing I knew, probably a half hour later, they were kind of walking around no beer. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm not going to ask them if they want another one because obviously they just paid for a picture with dimes and quarters. I have a real good feeling they don't have any more money. Um, money meant nothing to Matthew because he came from a lot of it. No, and he would hand over his wallet in two seconds, you know, because money meant nothing. Um, his shoes, however, you know, they might have meant something. Um, you know, they can say it was robbery. I don't buy it. No, not even for an iota of a second. Then a few moments later, I looked over and Aaron and Russell had been talking to Matthew Shepard. Aaron said that a guy walked up to him and said he was gay and wanted to get with him and Russ. Christine Price girlfriend of Aaron McKinney. And Aaron got aggravated with it and told him he was strange, didn't want anything to do with him and walked off. He said that's when he and Russ went into the bathroom to pretend they were gay to get him in the truck and rob him. They just wanted to teach him a lesson not to come on the straight people. It's said that Matt approached them, that he came onto them. I absolutely positively disbelieve and refute the statement 100%. Refute it, and I'm gonna give two reasons why. One is character reference. Why would he approach them? Why them? He wasn't approaching anybody else in the bar. They hit. They say he's a gay. He was a flaming gay. He's going to come on to people like that. Bull. Yeah. He never came on to me. Hello? He came on to them? I don't believe it. Two is territorialism. It is the word I will use for this. And that's the fact that Matt was sitting there. The pool area. Upon their first interaction, they were in Matt's area. In the area Matt had been seen in all night. So who approached you by that? Um, but Matthew was the kind of person... Like, he would never not talk to anyone for any reason. If someone started talking to him, he'd just be like, oh, you know, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you know, he, he never had any problem just, just striking up a conversation with anybody. Matt did feel lonely a lot of times. And me knowing that and knowing how gullible Matt could be, 
he would have walked right into it. The fact that he was at the bar alone, without any friends, just made him that much more vulnerable. So the thing is, and, and this is what I'm testifying to, because you know I'm, I'm basically the key eyewitness in this case. Uh, basically what I'm testifying is that I saw Matthew leave. I saw two individuals leave with Matthew. I didn't see their faces, but I saw the back of their heads. At the same time, McKinney and Henderson were no longer around. You do the math. Moment, McKinney and Henderson. You know, I've known Aaron for a long time. And Aaron was a good kid. I liked Aaron a lot. That's why I was shocked when I heard this. I'm like, I know he was, he was living out far at his trailer house is what he told me with his girl. They just started dating last summer and they must have gotten pregnant as soon as they started dating. You know, because they had a kid. There he was, 21 years old, but he was running around with the kid. You see, that's that's the kind of person Aaron was. He just, like, he always dressed big in big clothes, you know, like Tommy Hilfiger, Polo, Gucci. At the time I knew him, he was just, he was just a young kid trying to, you know, he just wanted to fit in. You know, acting tough, acting cool. But, you know, you could get in his face about it and he would back down. Like, he was some scared kid, you know. Sherry Anninson. Russell, he was just so sweet. He was the one who, who was the Eagle Scout. I mean... His whole presence was just quiet and sweet. So, of course, it doesn't make sense to me. And I know people snap and whatever, but our relationship wasn't a, a real intimate one. I, I was just his landlord. I did work with him at the chuck wagon, too, though. And I remember, like, at the Christmas party, he was just totally drunk out of his mind. Like, we were all pretty much just part of part of time. And, and he wasn't belligerent. He didn't change. His, his, his personality didn't change. He was the same little meek Russell. I, I remember him coming up to me and saying, Sherry, when you get a chance, can I have a dance? Which we, we never did get around to doing that, but... Now I just want to shake him, you know? What were you thinking? What in the hell were you thinking? Moment, the fence. The fence. I've been out there four times. I've taken visitors. That place has become a pilgrimage site. Clearly, that's a very powerful personal experience to go out there. It's so stark and so empty, and you can't help but think of Matthew out there for 18 hours in nearly freezing temperatures, with the view up there isolated, and the God, my God, why have you forsaken me, comes to mind. Company member, Greg Periotti. Bill Labrie, a friend of Matthew's, took us out to the fence this morning. Now, I broke down the minute I touched it. I just feel such a strong kinship with this kid on the way back i made sure that nobody could see me crying lee fondakowski craig was crying on the way back i couldn't bring myself to tears but i felt the same way i have an interview this afternoon with aaron Kreefels. he's the boy who found matthew out there by the fence i don't think i'm up for it right now i'll see if somebody else can do it moment Finding Matthew Shepard. Well, I, uh, I took off on my bike around 5 p.m. on Wednesday from my dorm. I just kind of felt like going for a ride, so I went up to the top of Cactus Canyon. And I'm not super familiar with that area, so on my way back down, I, I didn't know where I was going. Uh, I was just sort of picking the way to go, which now it, it just makes me think that God wanted me to find him because there's no way I was going to go that way. Uh, so I was in some deep ass sand and I, I wanted to turn around, but for some reason I, I kept going and uh, I went along and, and there was this rock on the ground and I just drilled it. I went over the handlebars and ended up on the ground. Uh, so I got up and I just was kind of dusting myself off and I was looking around and I noticed something which ended up to be Matt. And he was just lying there by a fence and I, I just, I thought it was a scarecrow. I was like, Halloween's coming up, thought, 
thought it was a Halloween gag. So I didn't think much of it. So I got on my bike, walked it around the fence that was there. It was a buck type fence and uh, got closer to him. And I noticed his hair. And that was a major key to me noticing it was a human being was his hair. Cause I just thought it was a dummy. Seriously. I, I noticed, I even noticed the chest going up and down. Uh, I still thought it was a dummy. I thought it was like some kind of mechanism. Uh, but when I saw his hair, well, I knew it was a human being. So I, I ran to the nearest house and just ran as fast as I could and called the police. I responded to the call. Officer Reggie Fluey. When I got there, the first thing, at first the only thing I could see was partially somebody's feet and I got out of my vehicle and went over. I seen what appeared to be a young man, 13, 14 maybe, because he was so tiny laying on his back and he was tied to the bottom of the end pole. But I did the best I could, you know, the gentleman was laying on the ground, Matthew Shepard, he was covered in dry blood all over his head. There was dry blood underneath him and he was barely breathing, but he was doing the best he could. And I was going to breathe for him, but I couldn't get his mouth open. His mouth, it, it wouldn't open for me. So he was covered in, like I said, partially dry blood all over his face and his head. And the only place he did not have any blood on him was his face when, where what he appeared to be crying down his face. His head was all distorted, you know? It did not look normal. It, it looked as if he'd had a real harsh head wound. I was working the emergency room the night Matthew Shepard was brought in. I don't think any of us uh, can remember seeing a patient in that condition for a long time. Those of us who've worked in a big city hospital have seen this, but we have some people here who have not worked in big city hospitals and uh, it's, it's not something you expect here. You expect it, you expect these kinds of injuries to come from a car going down a hill at 80 miles an hour. You expect to see gross injuries from something like that, this horrendous, terrible thing but you don't expect to see that from someone doing this to another person. The ambulance report said it was a beating, so we knew. There was nothing I could do. I mean, if there was anything that I could have done to help him, I would have, but there was nothing. And I was yelling at the top of my lungs that I'm trying to get something out of him, like, hey, wake up, hello, but he didn't move, he didn't flinch, he didn't anything. He was tied to the fence. His hands were thumbs out in the cuffing position, the way we handcuff people. He was bound so tight with a real thin white rope and it went all the way down to the bottom of the pole about four inches up on the ground. And his shoes, was, his shoes were missing, he was tied, extremely tight. So I used my boot knife and I tried to slip it in between the rope and the fence and his wrist. And I, I had to be extremely careful not to harm Matthew any further. Your first thought is, well, certainly you'd like to think is that it's somebody from out of town who comes through and beats somebody. I mean, things like this happen, shit happens, and it happens in Laramie, but if there's been somebody who's been beaten repeatedly, uh, certainly it's something that offends us. I think that's a good word. It offends us. He was bound so tight. I finally got the knife through there. I'm sorry. We rolled him on his back and onto his left side and when we did that he quit breathing immediately I put him back onto his back and there was just it was just enough of, a, of an adjustment it gave me enough room to cut him free there I seen the EMS unit trying to get the location and once the ambulance got there we put a neck collar on him and placed him on a backboard and scooted him up from underneath the fence and then Rob drove the ambulance to Envision Hospital emergency room now, the strange thing is, 20 minutes before Matthew came in, Aaron McKinney was brought in girl by his girlfriend. Now, I guess he had gotten into a fight later on that night back in town. So I'm working on Aaron and the ambulance comes in with Matthew. Now, at this point, I don't know that there's a connection at all. So I tell Aaron to wait and I go to treat Matthew. So there's Aaron in one room of the ER and Matthew in another room, two doors down. Now, as soon as we saw Matthew, it was very obvious his care was beyond our capabilities. I called the neurosurgeon at Poudre Valley and he was on the road in an hour and 15 minutes, I think. They showed me a picture. Days later, I saw a picture of Matthew. I would have never recognized him. 
then two days later, I found out the connection and I was very struck. They were two kids. They were both my patients and they were two kids. I took care of both of them, of their bodies. And for a brief moment, I wondered if this is how God feels when he looks down at us, how we are all his kids, our bodies, our souls. And I felt a great deal of compassion for both of them. Moment, a Laramie man. This is John Peacock, Matthew's academic advisor. Well, the news report started rolling in on about Thursday, but no names were mentioned and the brutality of the crime was not mentioned. All that was mentioned was that there was a man, a Laramie man, found beaten on the prairie, basically. And later on in the evening, they mentioned his name. It was like, that can't. That's not the Matthew Shepard I know. That is not my student. That is not this person who I've been meeting with. Um, I was in the coffee shop. Romaine Patterson. And um, someone pulled me aside and said, I don't know much, but they say there's been a young man who's been beaten in Laramie. And they say his name is Matthew Shepard. And he said, well, do you think it could be your Matthew? And I... Um, and I said, well, it sounds like it could be your Matthew. Now, so I called up my sister, Trish, and I said, tell me what you know. I'm just like, I need to know anything you know, because I don't know anything. So I'm talking to my sister on the phone, and that's when the whole story came up on Channel 5 News, and it was just like, ba-boom. And the news reports kept rolling in about a young University of Wyoming student, you know, his age, his description, and it was just like, oh my God. And um, I, uh, yeah, I felt in like sick to my stomach. Just, it was instantly sick to my stomach and I had to tell Romaine, yeah, it was Matthew, it was your friend. Well, I'll tell you what is overwhelming. Matt Galloway. Friday morning, I first find out about it. I go to class, walk out, boom, there it is, in the branding iron. So I immediately drive to the nearest newsstand, buy a Laramie boomerang, because I want more details. By that, go home. Before I can even open the paper, my boss calls me. He says, you hear about what happened? I'm like, yeah. Was he in the bar Tuesday night? I go, yes, yes, he was. You've got to get down to the ball right now. We've got to talk about this. We've got to discuss what's going on. By this time, I was starting to get upset, but still the severity wasn't out yet. It was Thursday afternoon. Rulon Stacy at Poudre Valley Hospital. I got a call. Um, you know, we just got a kid from Wyoming. Looks like he may be the victim of a hate crime. And we've got a couple of newspaper reporters here asking questions. And so we agreed we need one sp spokesperson. Um, you know, as CEO, I'll do that. And uh, we'll try and gather all the information that we can. Um, and then I watched the 10 o'clock news that night, you know, where they discussed the seriousness and the... Um, in the severity of it. So I'm on the phone with Mickelson and he's like, we need to go to the arraignment so we can identify these guys and make sure that those are the guys in the ball. So we go to the arraignment. Moment, the essential facts. Our focus today turns to Laramie, Wyoming and the Albany County Courthouse where Aaron James McKinney and Russell Arthur Henderson are being charged with the brutal beating of Matthew Shepard, a gay university Wyoming student. Catherine Connolly. The arraignment was on Friday, right around lunchtime. And I said, I'm just going. I just took off. It's just down the street. So I walked a few blocks and I went. Has anybody told you about the arraignment? There were probably about a hundred people from town and probably as many news media. By that point, a lot more of the details had come out. The fact that the perpetrators were kids themselves, local kids that everyone who's from around here has some relationship to. And I think everyone was really waiting on pins and needles for what would happen when the perpetrators walked in. And what happened? There's 200 people in the room at this point. They walk in in their complete orange jumpsuits and shackles and you could have heard a pin drop. It was incredibly solemn. I mean, lots of people were teary at that point. Then the judge came in and did a reading. There was a reading of the evidence that the prosecution had and it's, just, it's a reading of the facts. And the reading of the facts was, 
The essential facts are that the defendants, Aaron James McKinney and Russell Arthur Henderson, met Matthew Shepard at the Farside Bar. And after Mr. Shepard confided he was gay, the subjects deceived Mr. Shepard into leaving with them in their vehicle to a remote area. Upon arrival at said area, both subjects tied their victim to a buck fence, robbed him, tortured him, and beat him. Both defendants were later contacted by officers of the Laramie Police Department, who observed inside the cab of their pickup a credit card and a pair of black patent leather shoes belonging to the victim, Matthew Shepard. I don't think there was any person who was left in the courtroom who wasn't crying at the end of it. I mean, it lasted five minutes, but it kept on getting more and more horrific, ending with. Said defendants left the victim begging for his life. Moment, live and let live. Rob Debris. Now, how could this happen? I, I think a lot of people just don't understand. And even I don't really understand how someone can do something like that. We have one of the most vocal populations of gay people in the state. And it's pretty much live and let live. So that was the arraignment. And my response was pretty catatonic not sleeping, not eating, don't, you, you know, don't leave me alone right now. More and more details came in on about the sheer brutality, motivations, how this happened. And quite frankly, the media descended and there was no more time to reflect on it anymore. Moment, the gem city of the plains. Laramie, Wyoming, often called the gem city of the plains is now the eye of the storm. The Cowboy State has its rednecks and yahoos for sure, but there are no more bigots per capita in Wyoming than there are New York, Florida, or California. The difference is that in Wyoming, there are fewer places to blend in if you're anything other than the prairie stock. Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson came from the poor side of town, both from broken homes and as teenagers had run-ins with the law. They lived in trailer parks and scratched out a living working at fast food restaurants and fixing roofs. As a gay college student lay hospitalized in critical condition after a severe beating. This small city, which bills itself as Wyoming's hometown, wrestled with its attitudes towards gay men. Now people would like to think what happened to Matthew was an exception to the rule, but it was an extreme version of what happens in our schools on a daily basis. It's a tough business, as Matt Shepard knew and all his friends all know, to be gay in a cowboy country. It was huge. Yeah, it was, it was herds, and we're talking like hundreds of reporters, which makes a huge dent in this town's population. There's reporters everywhere, news trucks everywhere on campus and everywhere in the town. And we're not used to that kind of, that type of attention to begin with. We're not used to that type of exposure. Tiffany Edwards, local reporter. These people are predators, like. This one journalist actually caught one of the judges in the bathroom at the urinal and was like asking him questions. And the judge was like, excuse me, can I please have some privacy? And the journalist was like offended that he asked for privacy. I mean, well, this is not how journalism started, you know, like the Gutenberg press, you know. I'll tell you what, when hard copy came and taped me, I taped him back at the exact same time. I have every word I have ever said on tape. So if they ever try to do anything funny with it, they better watch their fucking ass. Wyoming Governor Jim Jeringer, a first term Republican up for re-election. I am outraged and sickened by the heinous crimes committed today on Matthew Shepard. I extend my most heartfelt sympathies to the family. Governor, you haven't pushed the hate crime legislation in the past. I'd like to urge the people of Wyoming against overreacting in any way that gives one group special rights over others. We will wait and see if the vicious torture and beating of Matthew Shepard was indeed motivated by hate. Well, you've got the beginning of the news store where they have the graphics in the background and they've got Moda in Wyoming and Wyoming's drooping red like it's got blood on it or something. And it's just like, what's the, what is this, this, this is sensationalism, and we're here going, wait a minute, we had the guys in jail in less than a day. I think that's pretty damn good. Look, I do think that um, the media actually made people accountable because they made people think, because people were sitting in their homes and like watching TV and listening to CNN and watching Dan Rathers and going, Jesus Christ, well, that's not how it is here. 
Well, how is it here? And for us to be more or less maligned? Aline Engen. That we're not a good community, and we, we are. The majority of people here are good people. You get bad apples once in a while, and, and I, I think the gay community took this as an advantage, said this is a good time for us to exploit this. Bill McKinney, father of one of the accused. Had this been heterosexual, these two boys decide to take out Rob. This would have never made national news. Now, my son is guilty before he's even had a trial. Moment, medical update. Matthew Shepard, medical update at 3 p.m. Saturday, October 10th. By this point, I looked out there and uh, where there had been two or three reporters, it must have been 10 or 15 still photographers, another 20 or 30 reporters and uh, 10 video cameras. The parents had just arrived and um, well, I'd barely introduced myself to them and I looked out there and I thought, my gosh, what am I going to do? Matthew Shepard was admitted in critical condition approximately 9.15 p.m. October 7th. When he arrived, he was unresponsive and breathing support was being provided. Matthew's major injuries upon arrival consisted of hypothermia and a fracture from behind his head to just in front of the right ear. This has caused bleeding in the brain as well as pressure on the brain. There were also several lacerations on his head, face, and neck. Matthew's temperature has fluctuated over the last 24 hours ranging from 98 to 106 degrees. We have had difficulty controlling his temperature. Matthew's parents arrived at 7 p.m. October 9th and are now at his bedside. The following statement is from them. First of all, we want to thank the American public for their kind thoughts about Matthew and their fond wishes for his speedy recovery. We appreciate your prayers and goodwill. And we know that Matthew would appreciate them too. We also have a special request for the members of the media. Matthew is in very much need of his family at this time. We ask you to respect our privacy as well as Matthew's so we can concentrate all of our efforts, love, and prayers onto our son. Thank you. Moment, seeing Matthew. Both Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson pled not guilty to the charges. Their girlfriends, Chastity Paisley and Christine Price, also pled not guilty after being charged as accessories after the fact. On our next trip, we spoke to the chief investigating officer on the case, Detective Rob Debris of the Albany County Sheriff's Department. I guess the thing that bothered me the most was when I went down to the Poocher Valley where Matthew was. And the thing that bothered me the most is seeing him, touching him. Now, as a homicide detective, you look at bodies. This poor boy sitting here fighting all his life trying to make it. I wanted it so by the book, you know. I keep seeing that picture in my head when I found him. Aaron Creeples. And it's not pleasant whatsoever. I don't want it to be there. I want to, like, get it out. That's the biggest part for me is seeing that picture in my head. And it's kind of unbelievable to me, you know, that I happen to be the person who found him. Because the big question with me, like, with my religion is, like, why did God want me to find him? I know how to take care of myself, and I was irrationally terrified. Catherine Connolly. So what that means is not letting my 12-year-old son walk the streets, seeing a truck do a U-turn, and thinking it's coming after me, having to stop because I'm shaking so bad. And in fact, the pickup truck did not come after me, but my reaction was to have my heart in my mouth. Ultimately, no matter how you dice it, I did have an opportunity. Matt Galloway. If I had amazing hindsight of 2020 to have stopped what occurred, and I, and I keep thinking I should have noticed these guys, shouldn't have been talking to this guy, I should have nodded my head down when I was washing those dishes for 20 seconds, things I could have done. What the hell was I thinking? Oh, you do a lot of studying. You spend hours and hours and hours. You study and study and study. Talking to the officers, making sure they understand. You talk to your witness again, and then always coming back to, I get this flash of seeing Matthew. 
I wanted it so tight that there was no way that these guys were going to get out of this. One of the things that happened when I got to the fence. Reggie Flutie. It was just such an overwhelming amount of blood. And we try to wear protective gloves, but, you know, we had a really cheap sheriff at the time and he bought us shit gloves, you know, and so, you know, you put them on and you put them on and they kept breaking. And so finally you just ran out of gloves, you know, and, and so you figure, well, you know, don't hesitate, you know, and, and so you, you do what your mind tells you to do at the time, you know, don't hesitate. And, and so you keep moving and you try to help Matthew and find an airway, you know, it's, it's what you do. The thing I wasn't telling you before is that Reggie is my daughter. Marge Murray. And when she first told me she wanted to be on the sheriff's department and be a police officer, well, I thought there was nothing better for her to do and she could handle whatever came her way. Probably a day and a half later, uh, the hospital called me and told me that Matthew had HIV. And the doctor said, you've been exposed and you've had a bad exposure because you see, I'd, I'd been building a, building a lean tube for my llamas and my hands had a bunch of open cuts on them. And so I was kind of screwed, you know? And, and so you think, oh shoot, you know? Would you like to talk about losing sleep? So I said to the doctor, okay, what do I do? And they said, you know, get up here. And so I got there and we started doing the ATZ drugs immediately. Now, they told me that's medication that if it's administered 36 hours after you've been exposed, it can maybe stop you from getting the disease. Now, that is a mean, nasty medicine. Mean. I mean, I've lost 10 pounds and a lot of my hair. And quite frankly, I wanted to lash out at somebody. Not at Matthew, please understand. Not one of us was mad at Matthew, but... They maybe wanted to squeeze McKinney's head off. And I think about Henderson and you know how two absolutely human beings can cause so much grief for so many people. It has been really terrible for my family, but mostly for Reggie and her kids. I think it brought home to my girls what their mom does for a living. Well, Reggie, you know what I'm gonna tell you now. My parents told me, you know, they both said the same damn thing. You're quitting this damn job. And, you know, it, it's a parent thing, you know, and they're terribly proud of you because you do a good job, whether you're handling a drunk or handling a case like this. But, you're, you know, they don't want you getting hurt. Like I said, there's a right way, there's a wrong way, and then there's Reggie's way. So I finally said, oh, for God's sakes, lighten up, Francis. You are so stubborn. They say I'm stubborn, but yeah, I don't believe them. But I just think, you know, okay, I've heard your opinion and now here's mine. No, I'm 39 years old. You know, what are they gonna do? Spank me? Reggie, don't give me any ideas. It look pretty funny, you know? What can they say? hope she doesn't go before me i just couldn't handle that moment email dr campway well this is a young person who read my statement on the denver post story and sent an email to me directly and said you and the straight people of laramie and wyoming are guilty of the beating of matthew shepherd just as the germans who look the other way are guilty of the deaths of the jews the gypsies and the homosexuals you've taught your straight children to hate their gay and lesbian brothers and sisters Unless and until you acknowledge that Matt Shepard's beating is not just a random occurrence, not just the work of a couple of random crazies, you have Matthew's blood on your hands. And, uh, well, I just can't begin to tell you what that does to you. And it's like, you can't possibly know what I'm thinking. You can't possibly know what this has done to me and my family or my community. Moment. Vigils. That first week alone, vigils were held in Laramie, Denver, Fort Collins, and Colorado Springs. Soon after, in Detroit, Chicago, San Francisco, Washington, D.C., Atlanta, Nashville, Minneapolis, and Portland, Maine, among others. In Los Angeles, 5,000 people gathered, and in New York City, a political rally ended in civilian disobedience and hundreds of arrests. 
and the Pudre Valley Hospital website received close to a million visitors from across the country and around the world, all expressing hope for Matthew's recovery. Moment. Medical update. Matthew Shepard Medical Update at 9 a.m. Sunday, October 11th. As of 9 a.m. today, Matthew Shepard remains in critical condition. The family continues to emphasize that the media respect their privacy, and the family also wants to thank the American public for their kind thoughts and concerns for Matthew. Moment. Live and let live. There are certain things when I sit in church. Jedediah Schultz. And the Reverend will tell you flat out that uh, he doesn't agree in homosexuality. And, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think that uh, right now I'm going through changes. I'm still learning about myself, and I will feel I know enough about certain things to make a decision that says homosexuality is right when I've been raised my whole life to think that it's wrong. And right now, I would say, uh, no, I don't agree with it. But, you know, maybe that's just because I couldn't do it. Um, speaking of religious terms, however, I don't think that's how God intended it to happen. Now, give me straight, though. I mean, I don't hate homosexuals. Not at all. Not, it's not going to be something that's going to get in between me and the other person at all. Well, you know, there's more gay people around Laramie than you think. Marge Murray. It doesn't bother anybody because most of them that are gay or lesbian, they know damn well who to talk to. If you step out of line, you're asking for it. And some people are saying he made a pass at them. You don't pick up regular people, right? I mean, I'm not excusing their actions, but it made me feel a bit better because Matthew Shepard was partially at fault. And the boys who did this to him were partially at fault. You know, it was sort of 50-50. Well, it's preaching schools at being gay is okay. Governor Geringer. And if my kids asked me, I'd set them down and I'd say, look, this is what gay people do. This is what animals do. And I tell them, this is the life, this is the lifestyle, and this is what they do. And I'd say that this is why I believe that it is wrong. Yes, as a lesbian, I was more concerned for my safety. Zaki Salmon. Well, I think we all were, and I think it's because somewhere inside, we know what could happen to us anytime. You know, I mean, I'd be afraid to walk down the street and display any sort of a physical affection for my partner. You don't do that here in Larry. There's this whole idea. You leave me alone, and I leave you alone. And it's even in some of the Western literature, you know, live and let live. It's such crap. I mean, I tell my friends that, even my gay friends bring it up sometimes. I'm like, this is crap, you know? I mean, basically what it boils down to, if I don't tell you I'm gay, you won't beat the crap out of me. I mean, what's so great about that? That's a great philosophy. Moment, Shannon and Jen. I was in the fireside in the afternoon and I ran into two friends of Aaron McKinney, Shannon and Jen. You both knew Aaron well, right? Yeah, we both did. When I first found out about this, I thought it was really, really awful. I don't know whether Aaron was fucked up or whether he was coming down or what, but Matthew had money. Shit, he had better clothes than I did. Matthew was a little rich bitch. You shouldn't call him a rich bitch, though. That's not right. Well, I'm not saying he's a bad guy either, because he was just in the wrong place at the wrong time and said the wrong things. I don't know. I won't lie to you. There was times I was all messed up on meth, and I thought about going out and robbing. I mean, I never did, but yeah, it was there. It's easy money. Aaron's done that thing before. They both done it. I know one night they went to Shine to go do it and came back with probably $300. I don't know if they ever chose, like, gay people as their particular targets before, but anyone that looked like they had a lot of money and that, you know, they could outnumber or overpower was fair game. But that contributed to some of it? Probably. It probably would have pissed him off that Matthew was gay because he didn't like gay people that I've seen him interact with. He was fine as long as they didn't flirt with him. As long as it didn't come up. Yeah, as long as they weren't doing it in front of him. Do you get the impression that Aaron knew other gay people? I'm sure he knew people that are gay. I mean, he worked up at KFC, and there was a couple of people up there that, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm not saying it's bad or anything, because I don't know. Half the people I know in Laramie are gay. What would you guys say to Aaron if you could see him and talk to him right now? First of all, I'd ask him if he'd do any more tweets. He wouldn't, I bet. 
if I saw Aaron now, I'd be like, man, why'd you fuck up like that? But I want to make sure he's doing good in there. But I'm sure he is, though. I probably just want to hang out with him. Smoke a bowl with him? I bet he wants one so bad. So you guys both went to Laramie High? Yeah, can't you tell? We're a project of our society. Moment. Homecoming. On a day that is traditionally given over to nothing more profound than the collegiate exuberance and the fortunes of the University of Wyoming football team, this community on, on the High Plains had a different kind of homecoming this Saturday, as many searched their souls in the wake of a vicious, apparent anti-gay hate crime. Dr. Cantway of Ivyson Memorial Hospital. This was homecoming weekend. There were a lot of people in town and there's a homecoming parade that was scheduled. And then the students organized to tag onto the back of it, you know, behind the banner supporting Matt. And everybody was wearing the armbands that the students had created. I live in the center of town. Harry Woods. And my apartment has windows on two opposite streets. One goes north and one goes south. And that is exactly the homecoming parade route. Now, on the day of the parade, I had a cast on my leg because of a fall. So I was really disappointed because I really wanted to walk with the people who were marching for Matthew. But I couldn't. So, so I watched from my window and it was, it was just, I'm 52 years old and I'm gay and I, I've lived here for many years and I've seen a lot. And I was really moved when I saw the tag on the end of the homecoming parade. About a hundred people walking behind a banner for Matthew Shepard. So then the parade went down to the end of the block to make a U-turn and I went to the other side of my apartment to wait for it to come south down the other street. I was right up there uh, where they're holding the banner for Matthew. And let me tell you, I've never seen, I've never had goosebumps so long in my life. It was incredible. A mass of people, families, mothers, holding their six-year-old kids, tying these armbands around these, uh, these six-year-old kids, trying to explain to them why they should wear an armband. Just amazing. I mean, it was absolutely one of the most beautiful things I've ever done in my life. Well, about 10 minutes went by and sure enough, the parade started to come down the street. And then I noticed the most incredible thing. As the parade came down the street, the number of people walking for Matthew Shepard had grown five times. There were at least 500 people marching for Matthew Shepard. 500 people, can you imagine? The tag at the end was larger than the entire parade and people kept joining in and you know what? I started to cry. Tears were streaming down my face and I thought, thank God I got to see this in my lifetime. And my second thought was, thank you, Matthew. Moment, one of ours. I really haven't been all that involved per se. My husband's a highway patrolman, so that's really the only way that I've known about it. Now, when I first found out, I thought it was just, horrible i i don't nobody deserves that i don't care who you are but the other thing that was not brought out at the same time that this happened that patrol man was killed and there was nothing nothing they didn't say anything about the old man that killed him he was just driving around and he shouldn't have been and he killed him and you know what it was just a little piece in the paper. And we lost one of our guys, you know? My husband worked with him. This man was brand new on the force. But I mean, he is one of ours and it was just a little piece in the paper. And a lot of my feeling is that the media is portraying Matthew Shepard as a saint and, and they're making him a martyr and I don't think he was. I do not think that he was that pure. Now, I didn't know him, but there are just so many things that I found out about him. I just, it's scary, okay? You know, about his character and, and, and spreading AIDS and, you know, being the, the kind of person that he was. He was just a bar fly, you know? And I, I think he pushed himself around. I, I think he flaunted it. Everybody's got problems, but why they exemplified him, I do not know. What's the difference if you're gay? A hate crime is a hate crime. If you murder somebody, you hate them. 
It has nothing to do with whether you're gay or a prostitute or, or whatever. I don't understand. I really do not understand. Moment. Two queers and a Catholic priest. Company member Lee Fondakowski. This is one of the last days on our second trip to Laramie. Greg and I have been conducting interviews nonstop and we're exhausted. We're supposed to meet with Father Roger at 7.30 in the morning. I was wishing I could skip it altogether, but we have to follow through to the end. So here we go. 7.30 a.m. Two queers and a Catholic priest. Matthew Shepard has served us well. You realize that? He has served us well. And I do not mean to condemn Matthew to perfection, but I cannot mention anyone who has done more for this community than Matthew Shepard. And I'm not gonna sit here and say, I was just this bold guy, no fear. I was scared. I was very vocal in this community when this happened. And I thought, you know, should we, uh, should we call the Bishop and ask him permission to do the vigil? And I was like, hell no, I'm not going to do that. His permission doesn't make it correct. You realize that. And I'm not knocking bishops, but what is correct is correct. You people are just out here on a search though. I will do this. I will trust you people that if you write a play of this, that you say it right, say it correct. I think you have a responsibility to do that. Don't, 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 um, don't make matters worse. You think violence is what they did to Matthew? They did do violence to Matthew, but you know, every time that you're called a slur, do you realize that that is violence? That is the seed of violence. And I would resent it immensely if you used anything I said uh, to you know, somehow cultivate that kind of violence. Even in its smallest form, I would resent it immensely. You need to know that. Thank you, Father, for saying that. Just deal with what is true. You know what is true. You need to do your best to say it correct. Moment, lifestyle two. Hello. Reverend? Yes, hello. I believe your wife told you a bit about why I'm contacting you. Yes, yes, she did. And let me tell you, uh, I don't know that I really want to talk to anyone about any of this incident. Uh, I am someone involved, and I just don't think... Yes, I completely understand, and I don't blame you. You know, I went to your service on Sunday. You went to the services on Sunday? Yes, I did. On this Sunday? Yes. This past Sunday. Did I meet you? Uh, yes, I believe at the beginning. I see. Well, let me tell you, I'm not afraid to be controversial or to speak my mind. And that is not necessarily the views of my congregation, per se. Now, as I said, I am someone involved that half the people in the case, well, the girlfriend of the accused is a member of our congregation. And one of the accused has visited. Mm hmm now, for those two people the accused have forfeited their lives, we've been after the two I mentioned for ages, trying to get them to live right, to do right. Now, one boy is on suicide watch, and I am working with him until they put him in the chair and turn on the juice. I will work for his salvation. Now, I think they deserve the death penalty. I will try to deal with them spiritually. Thank you, Reverend. Now, as for the victim, I know that this lifestyle is legal, but I will tell you one thing. I hope that Matthew Shepard, as he was tied to that fence, that he had time to reflect on a moment when someone had spoken the word of the Lord to him, and that before he slipped into a coma, he had a chance to reflect on his lifestyle. Thank you, Reverend. I appreciate your speaking with me. Moment that night. Well, um, it was about 11.30 that night, and uh, uh, I had just barely gone to bed, and uh, Margo, our chief operating officer, well, she called and uh, said, you know, um, his blood pressure has started to drop. You know, well, let's, let's wait and see. And um, she called me about 10 after and he just died. So I quick, uh, I quick got dressed and, uh, and came in and I went to the ICU where the family was and Judy came up and uh, she put her arms around me and uh, and uh, we, we just stood there, you know, uh, honestly, for about 10 minutes, um, just because, you know, what else do you do? And um, we had to sit and talk about things that you just, uh, 
you know, Dennis, it's now public knowledge. And uh, and I'm going to go out there now and tell the whole world that this has happened. Because uh, by this point, it was clear to us that uh, it was the world. It was the whole world. And so Judy told me what she wanted me to say. And uh, I went out at 4 a.m. Moment, medical update. Matthew Shepard, medical update. 4.30 a.m. Monday, October 12th. At 12 midnight, on Monday, October 12th, Matthew Shepard's blood pressure began to drop. We immediately notified his family, who were already at the hospital. At 12.53 a.m., Matthew Shepard died. His family was at his bedside. And the family did release the following statement. Our family asked again for me to express their sincerest gratitude to the entire world for the overwhelming response for our son. Our family is so grateful that they did not have to make a decision regarding whether to continue life support for our son. Like a good son. Carried to the end and removed all guilt or stress from our family. He came into this world premature, left the world premature. Matthew's mother said, Go home. Please just give your kids a hug and don't let day go by without telling them that you love them moment magnitude and uh i don't know how uh you know i let that happen um i lost it on national television but you know um we'd been up for like uh 72 72 hours straight and uh and uh, gone home and uh well gone to sleep for a half hour and I had to get up and come in. And uh, maybe I was just way, um, I don't know. Uh, but in a moment of complete brain deadness, while I was out there reading that statement, I thought about my own four daughters and go home and hug your kids. And um, she doesn't have her kids anymore. Um, and there I am and I'm thinking, this is so lame. Um, and we started to get, um, we started to get uh, uh, people sending us emails and uh, letters. And most of them were just generally very kind. Um, but I, uh, I did get this one. And this guy wrote me and he said, do you cry like a baby on TV for all your patients or just the gays? Um, and, uh, and as I told you before, uh, homosexuality is not a lifestyle with which I agree. Uh, I haven't been thrown into this. Well, um, I guess I didn't understand the magnitude uh, with which some people hate. And of all the letters that we got, there were maybe two or three that were like that. Um, but most of them were thank you for your caring and compassion. And. Uh, and Matthew had caring and compassion from the moment he got here. Moment. H-O-P-E. I spoke with Doc today and told him we'd soon be coming back for the upcoming trials of Russell Henderson and Aaron McKinney. And this is what he had to say. I'll tell you what. If they put those two boys to death, that would defeat everything Matt would be thinking about on them. Because Matt would not want those two boys to die. He would want to leave them with hope. H-O-P-E. Just like the whole world hoped that Matt would survive. The whole thing. You see? The whole thing ropes around hope. H-O-P-E. Moment. Snow. The day of the funeral, it was snowing so bad. Big, huge, wet snowflakes. And when I got there, there was thousands of people in just black with umbrellas everywhere. And there were two churches. Uh, one for immediate family, uh, invited guests, people of that nature, and then one church uh, for everybody who wanted to be there. 
And then still hundreds of people outside that couldn't fit into either of the churches. And there was a big park by the church and that's where the people were. And this park was full. The liturgy today is an Easter liturgy and it finds its meaning in the resurrection. The service invites your full participation. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. And I guess it was like the worst storm that they have had. Tiffany Edwards. Like that anybody could ever tell. Like trees fell down and the power went out for a couple days because of it. And I just thought, it's like the forces of the universe at work, you know. Whatever higher spirit, you know, is like that blows storms, is blowing this storm. For our brother Matthew, let us pray to our Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the resurrection and the life. We pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord. My most striking memory from the funeral. Tiffany Edwards. Is seeing the Reverend Fred Phelps from Canvas. Kansas, pardon me. That scene go up in the park. A bunch of high school kids who got out early came over and started yelling at some of these people in the protest, the Fred Phelps people. And uh, across the street, you had people lining up for the funeral. Well, I remember a guy, this skinhead coming over, and he was dressed in leather and spikes everywhere. And he came over from across the street where the protest was. And he came into the crowd and I just thought, oh, this is going to be a really ugly confrontation. But instead he came over and he started leading them in amazing grace. We wouldn't be here if this was just another murder the state was going to deal with. The state deals with hundreds of murders every single day, but this murder is different because the gays are bringing us out here, trying to make Matthew Shepard into a poster boy for the gay lifestyle. And we're going to answer it. It's just that simple. Six months later, the company returned to Laramie for the trial of Russell Henderson, the first of the two perpetrators. It was to be a capital murder trial. When we got to the Albany County Courthouse, Fred Phelps was already there. You don't like that attribute of God. But so was Romaine Patterson. That perfect attribute of God. Well, we love that attribute of God, and we're going to preach it. Because God's hatred is pure. It's a determination. It's a determination that he's going to send some people to hell. That is God's hatred. Um, after God's message. After seeing Fred Phelps protesting at Matthew's funeral and finding out that he was coming to Laramie for the trial of Russell Henderson, I decided that someone needed to stand toe to toe with this guy and share the differences. And I think at times like this, when we're talking as hatred as much as the nation right now, that someone needs to show that there's a, a better way of dealing with this kind of hatred. So our idea is to dress up like angels. We're standing here. So we have designed these angel outfits where our wings are like huge, like these big ass wings. And there are going to be about 10 to 20 of us. And what we're going to do is we're going to encircle Phelps. And because of our big wings, we're going to completely block him. So this big ass band of angels comes in. We don't say a fucking word. We just turn our backs when we stand there. And we are a group of people bringing forth a message of peace, love, and compassion. We're standing. calling an angel action. Yeah, this 21-year-old little lesbian is ready to walk the line with him. When those old preachers laid their hands on me, it's called an ordination. Mine was from Isaiah 581. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgressions. And I knew my angels were going to be taking the brunt of everything he had to yell and say. I mean, we're going to be blogging his view and he's going to be like pissed off to hell. So I bought all my angels earplugs. Moment. Jury selection. Romaine Patterson's sister, Trish Steger. As soon as they started the jury selection, you know, everybody was coming into my shop. But I don't want to be on this trial. I hope they don't call me or, oh, my God, I've been called. How do I get off? Just really wanting to get as far away from the trial as they could really fearful that they were going to have to be part of this jury. And then I heard that Henderson had to sit in the courtroom while they questioned the prospective jurors. And one of the questions they ask is, would you be willing to put this person to death? And I understand that most of the comments were, yes, I would. Yes, I would, Your Honor. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yep. No problem. Well, can you imagine hearing that, you know, juror after juror after juror? Moment. Russell Henderson. You entered a not guilty plea earlier, Mr. Henderson, but I understand you wish to change your plea here today. Is that correct? Mr. Henderson. Yes, sir. Correct? Thank you. You understand, Mr. Henderson, that the recommended sentence here is two life sentences. Yes, sir. Do you understand that those may run concurrently or they may run consecutively? 
Yes, sir. Mr. Anderson, I will now ask you how you wish to plead. Guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Before the court decides whether the sentence will run concurrent or consecutively, I understand that there are some statements to be made by at least one individual. This is an excerpt from a statement made to the court by Lucy Thompson. As the grandmother and the person who raised Russell, along with my family, we have written the following statement. Our hearts ache for the pain and suffering that the shepherds have went through. We have prayed for your family since the very beginning. Many times throughout the day, I have thought about Matt, and you will continue to be in our thoughts and prayers as we know your pain will never go away. You have showed us, you have showed us such mercy in allowing us to have this plea, and we are so grateful that you are giving us all an opportunity to live. Your Honor, we as a family hope that you sentence Russell and that you will do it concurrently, two life terms. For the Russell we know and love, we humbly plead, Your Honor, to not take Russell completely out of our lives forever. Thank you. Mr. Anderson, you have a constitutional right to make a statement if you would like to do so. Do you have anything you would like to say? Yes, I would, Your Honor. Mr. and Mrs. Shepard, there is not a moment that goes by that I don't see what happened that night. I know what I did was very wrong, and I regret greatly what I did. You have my greatest sympathy for what happened, and I hope that one day you will be able to find it in your hearts to forgive me. Your Honor, I know what I did was wrong, and I'm ready to pay my price for what I did. Mr. Anderson, you drove the vehicle that took Matthew Shepard to his death. You bound him to that fence in order that he might be more savagely beaten and in order that he might not escape to tell his tale. You left him out there for 18 hours, knowing full well that he was there, perhaps giving an opportunity to save his life, and you did nothing. Mr. Henderson, this court does not believe that you really feel any true remorse for the part in this matter. And I wonder, Mr. Henderson, whether you fully realize the gravity of what you've done. This court finds it appropriate, therefore, that sentences be, be ordered as follows. As to count three, that being felony murder with robbery, you are to serve a period of imprisonment for the term of your natural life. On count one, kidnapping, that you serve a period of imprisonment for the term of your natural life. Sentencing for count one to run consecutive to sentencing for count three. After the hearing, we spoke with Russell Henderson's Mormon home teacher. I've known Russell's family for 38 years. Russell's only 21, so I've known him his entire life. I ordained Russell the priest in the Mormon church. So when this happened, you can imagine disbelief. After the sentencing, the church held a disciplinary council. And the result of that meeting was to excommunicate Russell from the Mormon church. And what that means is that your name is taken off the records of the church. So you just disappear. Russell's reaction to that was not positive. It hurt him. It hurt him to realize how serious a trans transgression he had committed. But I will not desert Russell. That's a matter of my religion and my friendship with the family. Moment. Angels in America. Before we left Laramie, we met again with Rebecca Hilliker at the theater department. She is producing Angels in America this year at the university. I think that the focus the university has taken is that we have a lot of work to do. We have an obligation to find ways to reach our students. And, you know, the question is, how do we move or, well, how do we reach um, a whole state where there's some really deep-seated hostility towards gays? How do you reach them? This is the beginning. And uh, guess who's auditioning for the lead? Oh, God, my parents. All right. Jedediah Schultz. All right, so just hear me out, right? So um, my parents are like, uh, so uh, what play are you doing for school this year? And I'm like, uh, oh, we're doing Angels in America. Um, they're like, uh, Angels in America, isn't that that uh, play or that scene you did in high school, right? And I'm like, yes, yeah, it is. And my mom, she's like, uh, so you're going to audition for it? And I'm like, yeah. And we got this huge argument. And I knew uh, the best thing I knew I had them on, right, is uh, just before they'd seen me in the performance with Beth. And I killed like this little kid, Lady McDuff, and these two other dudes. And my mom, she keeps going. She's like, uh, but you know, homosexuality is a sin. And I'm like, mom, 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 hold, hold up, hold up. 
So I just played a murderer tonight and he didn't seem to have a problem with that. I'll tell you, I've never prepared so much for an audition in my life. Never, ever. Not even close. Not having to deal that much with the gay society here in Laramie. Detective Sergeant Rob Debris. Well, once we started working into the case and actually speaking to the people that were gay and finding out what the underlying fields were, well, then it sort of hit home. This is America. You don't have the right to feel that fear. And we're still going to have people who hold on to their old ideals. And I was probably one of them 14 months ago. And I'm not going to put up with it. And I'm not going to listen to it. And if they don't like my views on it, fine. The door goes both ways. I already lost a couple of buddies and I don't care. I feel more comfortable and I can sleep at night. Well, you're tested every three months. Reggie Flutie. And I was able to have a DNA test done. And so they, they got me to Fort Collins and they drew blood there and flew it to Michigan and did all the DNA work there. And which was uh, a week later, you know, and you think, thank God. I tell you, we were all on our knees saying Hail Marys. And you were just elated, you know? You think, thank God. So what's the first thing she does? I stuck my tongue right in my husband's mouth. I was just so happy, you know? And you're just so happy. And you think, yeah, I hope I did the service well. And, and you know, I, I hope I did, I did it with some type of integ integrity, you know? And you're just really happy. And my daughters, they just bawled. They were so happy. And the force. Oh, boy. We went out and got shit. shit they all bought me drinks, too. It was great. And everybody hugged and cried, you know. And I kissed everybody who walked through the door. Reggie, they don't need to know that. I didn't care if they were male or female. They each got a kiss on the lips. Now, what part of what I just said didn't you understand? Oh, get over it, Ma moment a death penalty case almost a year to the day that matthew shepard died the trial was set to begin for aaron james mckinney probably the question that most of you have in your mind is uh, uh how will the mckinney case proceed al rivertua prosecuting attorney and it's the decision of the county attorney's office that will definitely be a death penalty case oh, i don't know about the death penalty but i don't want to see them walk out of Rollins penitentiary or pay my nickel, or whatever, my little percentage of tax. Nickel a day to make sure his ass stays in there and never sees society again. And on definitely never comes into my bar again. I can't say what I would do. I'm too personally involved. Oh, I believe in the death penalty 100%, you know, because I want to make sure that guy's ass dies. This is one instance where I truly believe with all my heart, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Yeah, I don't, I don't believe in the death penalty. It's too much for me. Uh, I don't believe one person should be killed uh, as redemption for having another killed. Two wrongs don't make a right. I think right now our most important teachers must be Russell Henderson and Aaron McKinney. They have to be our teachers. How did you learn? What did we as a society do to teach you that? See, I don't know if many people will let them be their teachers. I think it would be wonderful if the judge said, in addition to your sentence, you must tell your story. You must tell your story. Moment, Aaron McKinney. During the trial of Aaron McKinney, the prosecution played a tape recording of his confession. My name is Rob Debris, Sergeant of the Sheriff's Office. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and may be used against you in the court of law. The following is an excerpt of that confession. Okay, so you guys, you and Russ, go to the fire side. So you got the fire side by yourselves, right? Yeah. Okay, so where do you go after you leave the far side? Some kid wanted to ride home. What do you look like? Mm, like a queer. Such a queer dude. He looks like a queer? Yeah, you know, like a homo. Okay, yeah. How'd you meet him? He wanted to ride home, and I just thought, I mean, the, the dude's drunk. Let's just take him home. When did you and Russ talk about jacking him up? We kind of talked about it at the bar. Um, okay. What happened next? We drove him out past Walmart. 
got over there and he starts, you know, grab my leg and reaching for my genitals. And I was like, look, not a fucking gay. Touch me like that. You're going to get it. I, I, I don't really know what got into me. Um, he was, I beat him up pretty bad though. I uh, think I killed him. What'd you beat him with? Blacked out um, my fist, my pistol, the butt of the gun. Wondering what happened to me. I had a few beers, but uh, I don't know. I couldn't really tell what was going on. It was almost like someone else was doing it. What was the first thing that he said or that he did in the truck that made you hit him? Uh, well, he put his hand on my leg and slid his hand up as if he was going to grab my balls. Moment. Gay panic. When the defense team argued that McKinney did what he did because Matthew made a pass at him, well, I just wanted to vomit because that's like saying that it's okay. It's like the Twinkie defense uh, when that guy killed Harvey Milk in, uh, how do you say, Moscone? It's the same thing. Um, as, as much as part of me didn't want the defense, them saying that it was a, a gay bashing or it was a gay panic, um, Part of me was uh, grateful because I was really scared that in the trial they were going to try and say that it was a robbery or it was about drugs. <laughs> you know, so when I so when I heard about them using gay panic as their defense, I felt you know this is good. Nothing else. The truth is going to be told. The truth is coming out. Moment, Aaron McKinney. Did he ever try to defend himself against you or hit back? Yeah, sort of. He tried his little swings or whatever, but he wasn't very effective. Okay. How many times did you hit him inside the truck before you got to stop where you left him? I'd say I hit him two or three times, probably three times with my fists and about six times with the pistol. Did he ask you to stop? Well, yeah. I mean, he was getting the shit kicked out of him. Well, what did he say? After he asked me to stop, most all he was doing was screaming. So Russ kind of dragged him over to the fence. I'm assuming it tied him up. Something like that. I just remember Russ was laughing at first, but then he got pretty scared. Was Matthew conscious when Russ tied him up? Yeah, I told him to turn around and don't look at my license plate number because I was scared he would tell the police. Um, and when I asked him what my license plate said, he... Uh, read it and so that's why I hit him a few more times so just to be sure you obviously don't like gay people do you no I don't would you say that you hate them I really don't hate them but you know when they start coming on you and stuff like that I get pretty aggravated did he threaten you the gay dude yeah uh not really can you answer me one more thing? Why'd you guys take your shoes? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm never gonna see my son again. I don't know. You'll probably go to the court sometime today. Today? So, I'm just gonna go up to, uh, and just plead guilty or not guilty. Oh no! You're just gonna be arraigned today. He is gonna die for sure. There's no doubt that Mr. Shepard is going to die. So what are they going to give me? 25 to life or just the death penalty and get it over with? See, that's not our job. That's the judge's job and the jury. Moment, the verdict. Has the jury reached a verdict? We have, Your Honor. We, the jury, impaneled and sworn to try the above entitled case after having well and truly tried the manner unanimously find as follows. As to the charge of kidnapping, we find the defendant, Aaron James McKinney, guilty. As to the charge of abrogated robbery, we find the defendant, Aaron James McKinney, guilty. As to the charge of first degree felony murder, we find the defendant, Aaron James McKinney, guilty. As to the charge of first degree felony murder, we find the defendant, Aaron James McKinney, guilty. As to the charge of premeditated first degree murder, we find the defendant, Aaron James McKinney, not guilty. As to the lesser included offense of second degree murder, we find the defendant, Aaron James McKinney, guilty. Moment, Dennis Shepard's statement. 
Aaron McKinney was found guilty of felony murder, which meant the jury could give him the death penalty. That evening, Judy and Dennis Shepard were approached by McKinney's defense team, who pled for their client's life. The following morning, Dennis Shepard made a statement to the court. Here is some of what he had to say. My son, Matthew, did not look like a winner. He was rather uncoordinated and wore braces from the age of 13, except the day he died. However, in his all too brief life, he proved that he was a winner. On October 6th, my son tried to show the world that he could win again. On October 12th, my firstborn son and my hero lost. On October 12th, my firstborn son and my hero died 50 days before his 22nd birthday. I keep wondering the same thing that I did when I saw him in the hospital. What would he have become? How could he have changed his beast in the world to make it better? Matt officially died in the hospital in Fort Collins, Colorado. He actually died on the outskirts of Laramie. Tied to a fence. You, Mr. McKinney, with your friend, Mr. Henderson, Left him out there by himself, but he wasn't alone. There were his lifelong friends with him, friends he had grown up with. He probably wondered who these friends were. First, he had the beautiful night sky and the same stars and moon that used to see through a telescope. Then he had the daylight and the sun to shine on him. And through it all, he was breathing in the scent of the pine trees from the snowy ranch. And he heard the wind, the ever-present Wyoming wind for the last time. He had one more friend with him, and he had God. And I feel better knowing that he wasn't alone. That's beating, hospitalization, and funeral focus worldwide attention on hate. Good is coming out of evil. People have said enough is enough. And I miss my son, but I'm proud to be able to say that he is my son. Judy has been quoted as being against the death penalty. It has been stated that Matt was against the death penalty. Now, you see, both these statements are wrong. Matt believed that there were crimes and incidents that justified the death penalty. I, too, believe in the death penalty. I would like nothing better than to see you die, Mr. McKinney. However, this is the time to begin the healing process, to show mercy on someone who refused to show any mercy. Mr. McKinney, I'm going to grant you life, as hard as for it is for me to do so. Because of Matthew, every time you celebrate Christmas, a birthday, the 4th of July, remember that Matt is in. Every time you wake up in your prison cell, remember that you have the opportunity and the ability to stop your actions that night. You robbed me of something very precious and I'll never forgive you for that. Mr. McKinney, I give you life in the memory of one who no longer lives. May you have a long life, and may you thank Matthew every day for it. Moment, aftermath. Uh, I'm just glad it's over, I really am. Testifying in that trial was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. And don't get me wrong, I love the stage, I really do. I love it, but it's tricky because basically what you have is lawyers questioning you from this angle, but the answers need to be funneling this way to the jury. Uh, so what you have to do is establish a funneling system. And that's hard for me because I'm a natural conversationalist. 
So it's just natural instincts that when someone asks you a question, you look at the person and make eye contact. But it's kind of tough when you literally have to scoot over, change your position, in effect, funnel over to where the jury is. But I was able to do that several times over the course of my testimony. Me and Debris hugged and cried and, you know, everybody had tears in their eyes. And you're just so thankful, you know, and Mr. Shepard was crying and, and that got me bawling. And everybody was just... This is all we've lived and breathed for a year. Daily. This has been my case daily. Now it's just over. Maybe now go on and we can quit being stuck, you know. It's time to move on. I think for even the citizens are having the town painted red, so to speak. They're just going to be glad to get to move on. It just hit me today, the minute that I got out of the courthouse, that the reason God wanted me to find him is for that he didn't have to die out there alone, you know? And if I wouldn't have came along, they wouldn't have found him for a couple of weeks at least. So it makes me feel really good that he didn't have to die out there alone. Moment, epilogue. On our last trip, I had the good fortune of seeing Jedediah Schultz play the role of Pryor in Angels in America. After performance, we spoke. I didn't for the longest time let myself become personally involved in the Matthew Shepard thing. It just, uh, it just didn't seem real. Matthew Shepard has become a name instead of an individual. And I, I just, I don't know. It's, it's been weird. It's, I just don't know. I feel bad for the person, you know, that I used to be for the things I said. Uh, that's why I wanted to hear those interviews from last year. Uh, Cause I just can't believe the things I told y'all. Um, all that stuff about homosexuals, you know, how did I let myself believe that you were different than me. This is Romaine Patterson. Well, um, a year ago, I wanted to be a rock star. <laughs> that was my goal. And um, now it's obviously changed in the fact that um, throughout the year, I've I really realized my role and I'm at taking part. And so uh, instead of going to school to be in music, I'm going to school for uh, political activism. And, um, you know, because I have a career in political activism. I actually recently found out that I'm going to be honored in Washington, D.C.'s Anti-Defamination League. And, you know, whenever I think about the angels or, or any of the speaking I've done, you know, um, Matthew gave me, like, Matthew's just, like, this guiding little path with his light for me to walk down, <laughs> you know? Like, every, sing every time we get to another door, he opens it. And he's just like, okay, next step. And if I gotta be a rock star on the side, okay. This is Zaki Salmon. Change is not an easy thing. And I don't think people are up to it here. You know, they got what they wanted. Those two boys got what they deserve and we look good now. Justice has been served, the okay corral. We shot down the villains. We sent the prostitutes on the train. The town is uh, cleaned up. We don't need to talk about it anymore. You know it's been a year since Matthew Shepard died, and they haven't passed shit in Wyoming. At a state level, any town, nobody anywhere has passed any kind of laws. Anti-discrimination laws or hate crime legislation, nobody has passed anything anywhere. What's come out of it? What's come out of it that's concrete or long-lasting? We would all meet one last time at the fence. I've been up there in my limousine, okay? And I remembered myself that night he and I drove around together, and he said to me, Laramie sparkles, doesn't it? And where he was up there, if you sit exactly where he was up there, Laramie sparkles from there. The low line cloud, it's the blue lights bouncing off the clouds from the airport, and it goes right over the whole city. I mean, it blows you away. Matt was right there in that spot. And I can just picture in his eyes, I can just picture what he was seeing. The last thing he saw on this earth were the sparkling lights. Moment, departure. We've spent the last two days packing a year's worth of materials and saying our goodbyes. We've been here six times and con conducted over 200 interviews. Jedediah cried when he said goodbye. Marge was just luck, and when we asked her how she would feel about seeing a play about herself, she said, I think we'd enjoy it. 
to show it's not the hellhole of the earth would be nice, but that is up to how you portray us. And that in turn is up to how Laramie behaves. As we were getting off the phone, she said to me, Now you take care, honey. I love you. Doc asked me if I wanted to ghost write a book about the whole event. Galloway offered me or anyone else a place to stay if and when we come back to Laramie. He also seemed interested as to whether there'd be any open auditions for this play. We left Laramie at about seven in the evening. On the way to Denver, I looked in my rearview mirror to take one last look at the town. And I will speak with you. I will trust that if you write a play of this, that you say it right. You need to do your best to say it correct. And in the distance, I could see those sparkling lights from Laramie, Wyoming. <laughs>